All right, everyone, we're going to get uh, started, um, and we'll let the rest of the people filter in as they finish getting food outside. But uh, thank you for attending this Federalist Society event today. My name is Sean Valley. I'm the uh, 2L president of our chapter here at Duke Law. Um, and thanks for attending our event today on a Supreme Court Roundup. Um, I uh, won't give an introduction uh, too extensively on the topics here. Um, I'll, I'll let our speakers do that. Uh, but the goal here is essentially to give you a, an understanding of some of the high-profile cases that the Supreme Court has reviewed recently and how, how those cases might in, impact uh, future constitutional doctrine. So today with us we have uh, Ilya Shapiro from the Cato Institute. And uh, he's a senior fellow in constitutional studies at the Cato Institute. And he's the editor-in-chief of the Cato Supreme Court Review. Um, before joining Cato, uh, Mr. Shapiro was a special assistant and advisor to the multinational force in Iraq on rule of law issues, uh, as well as serving in uh, private practice. Um, Mr. Shapiro has written uh, very extensively on constitutional issues. And uh, his publications have, um, you, you might find in the Wall Street Journal, the Harvard, Law and, um, Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, LA Times, US Today, New York Times. Um, and he's uh, provided commentary for media sources such as CNN, Fox News, ABC, CBS, um, and uh, NPR. Uh, he's also testified before Congress and state legislatures and uh, has filed various amicus briefs. So he'll be very valuable in providing you some commentary on some of the recent Supreme Court cases. Um, we also have uh, Professor Young joining us today, and uh, Professor Young um, um, teaches a wide variety of courses here at Duke Law, in, uh, including constitutional law, uh, federal courts, and foreign relations law. Um, he's one of the leading authorities on the constitutional law of federalism. Um, so our, our format today is going to be that Mr. Shapiro will provide um, some initial commentary and Professor Young will um, respond and add additional insights as, as they go along. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. Um, I was just in the faculty lounge uh, before this, and Justice Alito walks in, which uh, in my world, in our world, that's you know, a huge rock star. That's like for normal people, you know, Bono or Taylor Swift or, or, or someone like that, right? Uh, but I played it cool, um, you know, been there before. I've met him a couple of times. Uh, but just as we were both getting up around the same time to go to uh, our respective lunch events, I said, well, I hope you're not speaking at the same time I am. Uh, and I found out that he was teaching a seminar. So I'm very happy that none of you got into his seminar and instead you <laughs> are, are here to, to listen to me. Uh, and really, not having been a law student too long ago, although it recedes into the past with each passing year, I know that primarily you're here for the free non-pizza lunch. Uh, and that's perfectly fine. Secondarily, maybe to ingratiate yourself with Professor Young or other professors that might come. I'm happy to be your dining uh, entertainment. Um, well, let's dig right in. I'm going to hopefully spend about half the time on the last term, half the time on the, on the coming term. I want to start with a bit of an overview of where we are in terms of statistics and trends. Uh, now, last term, after several blockbuster years, I mean, we had really back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back -to -back terms of the century. It was just, uh, you know, please, no more. Those of us who are professional court watchers were like, let's just you know, focus on ERISA and bankruptcy cases this term, right? We want to take a breather, work on some longer form uh, writing or whatnot. But uh, that all changed. Uh, it was going to be a low-key term, but that all changed uh, last November when um, same-sex marriage and uh, Robert's care uh, came back onto the court's docket. Um, looking back on the term, we do see a few trends, less, uh, fewer unanimous rulings than previous years, more results that experts classify as liberal than conservative, although that's largely a function of the vagaries of the docket. This term, when everyone says, oh, it's, uh, if, if conventional wisdom holds and there are, uh, it's going to be a conservative term, doesn't mean the justices all of a sudden have changed their minds on what they uh, think about the law. Uh, and the lockstep voting of the liberal bloc uh, contrasted against the inscrutability of Justices Roberts and Kennedy. Um, actually, last term uh, regressed to the mean in terms of unanimity. 41% uh, of the cases, 30 of the 74, were uh, 9 to nothing, which seems like a huge drop from the previous term, 66%, two-thirds. But it was that term that's the real outlier. If you go back however many years you want to go back, 10, 15, 20 years, they're always generally within 35 to 50% uh, unanimous. Um, and actually, uh, they're sort of bipolar because you always have this 15 to 30 percent of the cases that are 5 to 4. 
Uh, and generally those are the ones that make the front pages, uh, although not always. Um, and in the previous term, the one where it was the, you know, the term of good feelings, uh, that kind of unanimity papered over huge doctrinal differences and produced strident concurrences that were dissents uh, in all but name. So really, I don't think there was that big a difference you know, last term compared to, to previous ones. Uh, but of course, as I said, those big cases did provide 5-4 uh, rulings, campaign finance, same-sex marriage, environmental regulation, the death penalty, uh, and that doesn't even count uh, Obamacare, Affordable Care Act, SCOTUS Care, Roberts Care, whatever you want to call it, right? That one was six to three, King v. Burwell. Um, the increase in split judgments did, however, result in significantly more dissents and opinions overall. Here's a tidbit. By the way, none of these stats is something that I came up with myself or even had my interns look up. This is right in SCOTUS blog. You can go through pages and pages. It can be a big hit at your next bar review or keg party or what have you. Uh, looking them all up. Uh, here's an interesting statistic. Justice Thomas produced the most pages of opinions. He was the hardest worker, 432 pages, more than triple uh, Justice uh, Ginsburg. As I said, none of these statistics are that remarkable. They fall within the general norm for uh, the modern court. What is remarkable is which justices were in the majority and which agreed with each other the most. And there you do see kind of a, a pronounced uh, difference. Justice Ginsburg, you might have heard over the summer, say that there was a real effort on uh, the part of the liberal justices to kind of uh, vote together and not have splintered concurrences and things like that. Uh, and so, whereas uh, kind of the modern norm is to have Justice Kennedy, the swing justice, right, be in the majority most often, he dropped a third. Uh, and Chief Justice Roberts, who either ties Kennedy or is second, dropped all the way to sixth. Instead, we have Justice Breyer in first, Justice Sotomayor in second, uh, and in terms of agreement rates, the top six pairings were all of those uh, uh, so-called liberal justices. Justice Breyer really was a, a most unusual, unlikely Mr. Congeniality uh, for the term. He was in the majority 92% of the time. But Kennedy did uh, end up in the majority most uh, in the five to four cases, 14 of the 19, uh, eight times with the liberals, five times with the conservatives, and once in a heterodox uh, coalition. Um, all right, statistics aside, the term was obviously overshadowed by two very big cases, which I'll get to in a moment. You have to get through some of your veggies before you get to that dessert. Um, let me start with uh, a case that uh, you might have heard of, um, but that is getting a lot of play in uh, unexpected ways in the lower courts now, and that's the Confederate flag license plate case, Walker versus Texas Division of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. Um, so Texas, I don't know how North Carolina does it, uh, but tech, I live in Virginia, we have a similar system where you can get um, specialty plates. This, that doesn't mean a vanity plate where you, you, know, you write litigator or go duke or whatever, right? Uh, this is the background. Uh, and on that you can get everything from, in Texas, you know, remember the Alamo, save the whales, uh, all these different uh, things. Uh, go uh, hook them horns, right? Uh, go Aggie, gig them Aggies, right? All, all these things. Um, and so uh, the Sons of Confederate Veterans, which is a, a group that traces their lineage uh, back to soldiers who fought for the Confederacy, uh, wanted to have a specialty plate for themselves, um, uh, but it was rejected by the DMV because it had a miniature Confederate battle flag and they thought that would be uh, offensive. And indeed, the authorizing statute for the DMV allows them to reject anything that might, uh, in their considered judgment, offend anyone. So in theory, they could reject every plate, right? Because that that Aggie plate's going to offend the, the, uh, uh, the, the Longhorns, and both of them are going to offend the Sooners, and vice versa. And there's, you know, uh, the, the Dr. Pepper plate and the, the taco stand and the burger joint plates, those are going to offend Michael Bloomberg. So uh, anything can, can offend uh, anyone uh, in this world, right? Um, everyone, the lawyers thought that, uh, you know, this is going to be a, a legalistic debate about the scope of the limited public forum doctrine, right? So the state makes this available, but the, you know, every, you know it's not the legislature that's approving these plates. They approve their own plates, but not all of the 400 by any means uh, are legislator approved or, 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 or enacted. Uh, and so, you know, what is the scope of the limited public forum? Is this like a public park? Is this like a billboard? What, what is this? And it turns out, uh, even though Texas won, um, the state won on the unlikely grounds that that specialty plate constitutes government speech, 
which is just bizarre, as, as Justice Alito uh, pointed out in dissent, uh, quote, if a car with a plate that says rather be golfing passed by, would you think this is the official policy of the state, better to be golfing than to work? Um, it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's odd. And uh, Justice Thomas provided the deciding vote, joining uh, the liberal justices this time without further uh, comment. It's, it's a curious case. I'm, I'm not sure uh, I don't, it was meant to go beyond the four corners of Confederate flags and license plates, but the first victim about a month after this ruling uh, were the Washington Redskins. Um, because a district judge deregistered their trademark on the same grounds that apparently a trademark is government speech. It's now up on appeal uh, in the Fourth Circuit. There's a similar case in the Federal Circuit. Uh, they could be affirmed, uh, you know, on, on different grounds. I, in fact, if they are affirmed, I, I hope they are. But it's a bizarre kind of statement that uh, what, intellectual property is now is now government speech. It's like I. Uh, you know, I read the news of this opinion on my government iPhone in an article by the government Washington Post, uh, you know, all, all the rest of it on my streaming government Facebook or, or what have you. Uh, so watch out for that in the First Amendment uh, area. And Professor Young has a, another First Amendment case that he's going to talk about. The case that would have been the biggest case this term had it not been for, for gay marriage and the return of the uh, ACA uh, is one called Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs versus the Inclusive Communities Project. Uh, this involves disparate impact theories in the context of the Fair Housing Act. Uh, so uh, in a lot of different kinds of civil rights laws, uh, employment and, and otherwise, uh, you can, might be, uh, have a claim or might be liable uh, not only if you intend to discriminate based on certain uh, protected categories, race, sex, religion, etc., uh, but if you have a neutral policy that has a disparate impact statistically on particular members of particular protected classes, unless you have a valid business or policy reason for enacting them. There's kind of this burden shifting going on. Uh, well, all the lower courts, uh, in terms of the Fair Housing Act, had applied or had allowed claims for disparate impact uh, uh, to go forward. There was no split, and yet the Supreme Court, for the third time in five years, really wanted to decide this issue. Uh, the previous two times, the government facilitated settlements because they expected um, the court, at least the majority here, to throw out uh, the use of disparate impact. Um, it was not to be. The government, uh, the, the Supreme Court ultimately ruled five to four to allow disparate impact claims, uh, although Justice Kennedy writing for the majority had a lot of language for defense lawyers about what you need to uh, establish and, and what kind of threshold uh, evidence you need to show. Uh, if you're a developer for the business reason for the, your, your particular policy that might have a disparate impact for if you're a, a government agency as was the, the, the defendant here, uh, what kind of policy reason. Um, and uh, Justice Thomas, I thought, uh, Justice Alito had the, the lead uh, dissent kind of uh, going after Kennedy's statutory interpretation. I'll let you review that uh, yourselves. But Justice Thomas had a broader point about how especially in the housing area, disparate impact uh, type of lawsuits can end up uh, hurting the very groups they're meant to uh, help. Uh, he talks about the Houston Housing Authority, which has only approved two uh, low-income development projects uh, uh, in recent years because developers and housing agencies are s essentially sued if you do, sued if you don't. Like in this case, uh, where uh, the issue here was the approval of uh, federal tax credits to developers to build low-income housing, uh, and the Texas agency approved uh, these developments, these tax credits for housing that was in predominantly uh, low to middle class uh, areas, which were disproportionately black. Uh, and rather than, as the plaintiffs here wanted them to be, in the whiter suburbs. Uh, well, uh, the whiter suburbs are also more expensive, so you can't build uh, as many of these units. And so, as Justice Thomas points out, you have tens of thousands of people who are eligible for public housing that aren't getting it because of these, um, the, the paralysis uh, in the system between either the housing agencies uh, or the developers. But uh, anyhow, this, I think, if you're going into housing law or, or uh, discrimination law of various kinds on whether plaintiff or defense side, this case provides a lot of work for you. So think about that as you go about your career services uh, interviews. Uh, next um, is a really unusual case, so unusual that for the first time ever, Cato filed a brief supporting the federal government. Okay. Uh, 
um, North Carolina Board of Dental Examiners versus the Federal Trade Commission, originating right here in, uh, in the Tar Heel State, right? Um, this old uh, antitrust immunity doctrine, Parker versus Brown, um, uh, from 1943, says that, uh, or I guess in, 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 at Duke, I should call it the Blue Devil State, right? I just thought about that, right? Anyhow. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the, the Parker Doctrine gives immunity to uh, states and private actors working under state behest, uh, even if they're doing things that would otherwise run them afoul of uh, anti-monopolization or anti-cartel laws. Uh, in this case, the North Carolina Board of Dental Examiners, which is basically a group of dentists who supervise uh, the, dentist, the dental uh, industry in the state, issued cease and desist orders, uh, letters uh, to um, uh, uh, pharmacists and beauticians and other kind of businesses that perform the very uh, sensitive and difficult procedure known as teeth whitening. Now this procedure is so uh, dangerous that you can go down to your corner CVS or Walgreens and get a kit and do it in the privacy of your own home. But we can't possibly allow non-dentists uh, to do it. Um, and they were sued by the Federal Trade Commission and said, this is purely a protectionist measure. You just don't want the competition from these uh, cheaper businesses. Uh, and they invoked this state action Parker uh, immunity. By a vote of six to three, uh, in an opinion by Justice Kennedy, the Supreme Court uh, sided with the FTC and said, look, state action implies that the state is actively supervising uh, the uh, the private actors and, and what have you. It's not just a, a rubber stamp. And here there wasn't even a, you know, deputy state undersecretary of health on the board or anything uh, like that. Um, already we've seen uh, attorneys general in other states writing opinion letters to their governors, to other executive branch agencies saying you need to tighten up how exactly we're supervising these various boards. That includes bar associations, by the way, because we don't want to run afoul of this new North Carolina dental test. It's kind of the flip side to a lot of the liberal, libertarian public interest lawsuits that have been filed by organizations like the Institute for Justice or Pacific Legal Foundation on economic liberty grounds, um, that, that you know, certain government laws, have occupational licensing, Uber, all these sorts of things, have no real purpose other than to, 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 to protect uh, existing uh, entrants, existing market participants. Uh, and here we're using the antitrust laws. It's a very interesting case, much written about in kind of the, uh, in, in academic circles already. All right, uh, let's move to King v. Burwell. Unlike the previous times where um, the, uh, where Obamacare was at the Supreme Court, uh, this does not involve a constitutional challenge to any part of the law, nor does it involve a request by a particular plaintiff to be exempt from part of a law based on religious or other types of obje objections. Uh, here we have an agency interpretation of the law, uh, in this case the, the IRS, um, which uh, interpreted um, uh, uh, the, 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 the section that, that said that people can get tax credits, subsidies, for buying insurance um, through, quote, exchanges established by the state. Well, a funny thing happened uh, in terms of Obamacare implementation and only 14 states set up their own exchanges, uh, defying kind of the, the intent of the designers of the law. Uh, and so the, the question is, what about that vast majority of states where it was healthcare.gov, the federal exchange from which people were buying uh, insurance policies? Are they also uh, eligible for uh, tax policies? Well, the court did a very interesting thing here. Uh, they didn't simply defer to the IRS saying, look, it's, the, the term is ambiguous, we have conflicting textual information, therefore this interpretation isn't crazy, isn't arbitrary and capricious in the term of art, uh, and therefore we will apply Chevron or some other kind of deference to what uh, the agency is doing here. No, Chief Justice Roberts for the, for the six justice majority explicitly disclaimed that. He said this is much too important an issue, there are millions, maybe even billions of dollars, uh, the whole operation of the law turns on this, no way that Congress could uh, simply delegate that to the IRS. Instead, uh, it's up to us, the court, to figure out what this means. And while the more natural reading uh, is to say that exchange established by the state means exchange established by the state, uh, in context, especially given the title of the law, Affordable Care Act, and uh, how its purpose is to provide more health care to, to more people, um, we don't think that Congress would have created a system 
whereby um, uh, people uh, don't get subsidies and can't afford uh, these insurance policies. Mind you, uh, there is no contemporaneous evidence from the time when the law was being written because if you'll recall, you might not recall, it's now starting to recede into the past. Six years ago, uh, when the Affordable Care Act was being drawn up sort of behind closed doors, uh, and then it was supposed to be amended and fixed for certain things, but then Scott Brown got elected to the Senate out of Massachusetts, which um, meant the Democrats no longer had a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate, uh, and you know, we had to pass it to know what was in it, in Nancy Pelosi's words, and, and we had this, this thing uh, that, that, that was passed that had lots of problems. Uh, but uh, a story could be told, and this is what the challengers were saying, uh, that uh, the designers wanted um, uh, uh, states to run their own exchanges, but they couldn't force them to do so because that would violate the anti-commandeering principle of our federalism, that the federal government can't just force state officials to, uh, to do certain things. Uh, and so we'll just incentivize the states to set up their exchanges. How will we do that? Well, we'll say that their citizens, their residents will only get tax credits if they set up exchanges. That's, to me, that's a plausible story. And if that's a plausible story, then you just go with the text. But as I said, the majority um, disagreed with that. Uh, in dissent, Justice Scalia said, words no longer have meaning if an exchange that's not established by a state is established by the state. He went on to call the majority opinion interpretive jiggery-pokery and pure <laughs> applesauce. Now, I was in Savannah, Georgia about a month ago, and there's a, a, a gastropub called the Moon River Brewing Company. I recommend it. Uh, I don't know if it's still on their list, but for their seasonal brews, they had one called Jiggery Pokery. And I, I tweeted this out. You can look this up. I think the uh, Federal Society National Headquarters for their Christmas party is going to have a, a keg of this. It's, it's very good. It, it uses uh, <laughs> old English uh, uh, hops. From, from before the revolution, so it's appropriate to use it in our uh, beer brewing, right? Uh, and anyway, I'll, I'll let you uh, go along with that. And finally, uh, same-sex marriage, Obergefell versus Hodges. Um, the court ruled famously five to four that states have to uh, provide marriage licenses to, uh, opposite, uh, to same-sex couples and therefore uh, recognize out-of-state licenses. Why? I have no idea. I've read this opinion too many times. It makes my head hurt every single time. It seems like you get a scoop of due process, a cup of equal protection, or maybe vice versa, sprinkle on some dignity, wrap it in a poetic bow, and, and voila. Um, that is not law, I suggest to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Now, and I say this having filed a brief supporting the challengers uh, to the state laws. To me, this seemed to be a uh, very straightforward equal protection issue. The meaning of the term equality under the law it has nothing to do with what the enactors of the 14th Amendment uh, intended for it to mean in 1868. I don't think they were really thinking about gay marriage, um, although they were thinking about marriage in various contexts. Uh, but it's what does the term uh, equality mean? And to me, this case is, uh, is not about what is marriage or who defines marriage. Uh, it's about occupational licensing. A state, for whatever reason, decides to license uh, marriage, uh, and it draws its licenses in a certain way. Um, is that line that they draw valid? Do they have a good enough reason uh, in the face of a claim under the 14th Amendment that this violates my individual rights or I'm not being treated equally? Uh, is, the re is, is the reason that the state have, uh, have, uh, has good enough? It's kind of like... Uh, you know, we can we you know, we know about driver's licenses, business licenses, right? Blind people cannot get driver's licenses, at least not during today's technology of driverless cars. Uh, of, of you can't have driverless cars yet. Uh, but uh, blind people can't be denied business licenses. Maybe a state could draw, come up with some reasons like, well, blind people are going to be defrauded if they can if they engage in a business. So we can whatever the state's reason. So is the marriage license uh, example more like denying blind people a driver's license or more like denying blind people a business license? What is the reason uh, good enough? But anyway, we didn't get that. We kind of got this, um, I don't know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, some Kennedy apologists say that he purposely did it that way so that it couldn't really be used as precedent in any other case. There's no real rule of decision. There's no scrutiny level or whether this is fundamental or whether there's a protected class or anything like that. It just kind of is. 
Uh, it was only meant to be cited, I guess, in people's marital vows, as it has been. There was an article about two months ago in the New York Times how both straight and gay couples are incorporating, especially the last paragraph of Kennedy's opinion in their, in their marriage ceremonies. But nevertheless, uh, it is what it is. And we don't know where we go from here in terms of people who disagree in good faith, uh, literally, uh, with no ill intent towards gay people. We don't know whether ministers, to the extent they play a dual role in signing state licenses, uh, what that has to say about whether they have to officiate gay weddings, not for religious purposes, but again, for the civil purpose. What about uh, bakers and photographers and you know, candlestick makers and butchers and all the wedding ven vendors? Is there a difference between private action and state action, as, as I would hold? Uh, or employment discrimination protections based on sexual orientation? Or, as came up during the oral argument, tax-exempt status for religious schools? All of this is unclear. Uh, and much depends on whether Kennedy himself will still be on the court when these issues come up for him to decide in his own hand-waving uh, way. Uh, but all of these examples, including licensing itself, show the folly inherent in government insinuation into uh, the sea of liberty upon which we're supposed to sail our ship of life. Um, if government didn't get involved in regulating private relationships between consenting adults, be they sexual, economic, political, or anything else, then we wouldn't be in this second best world of uh, adjudicating competing rights claims. Um, but that live and let live world is rapidly contracting, so we're forced to fight for carve outs of liberty among a sea of mandates, regulations, and other authoritarian nudges. So uh, good for the court, and while I echo uh, Kennedy's hope that both sides now respect each other's liberties and the rule of law, uh, I stand ready to defend anybody's right to offend, uh, hearkening back to that license plate case, uh, or otherwise live his or her life in ways I might not approve. Okay, moving into this term. We've already had two weeks of sittings. So far, pretty, pretty low-key technical cases. Um, in general, on the docket, we have, I think, 50 cases so far. Only a handful are really getting uh, attention. We'll see what happens. This could turn out to be the fifth consecutive term of the century of abortion and the death penalty and these other things, uh, little sisters of the poor, contraceptive mandate, uh, Hobby Lobby 2 sort of thing uh, comes back on. For now, the three biggest cases, um, I think, uh, I'll, I'll run through them. The first is uh, Evanwell versus Abbott. It's an election law case involving the meaning of one person, one vote. That is, it's been axiomatic for more than half a century uh, that you can't have disproportionate districts such that for example, you have, I'm stylizing this, 10 people, 10 voters in one district, 1,000 people, 1,000 voters in another district. That means that that first district, each vote, each person is 100 times as powerful uh, as in the second district. But what if there's a disparity between in the way districts are drawn in the number of people and the number of voters? Notice I kind of fudge that in the way I describe my stylized hypothetical. So in some counties, in some districts, uh, uh, especially the ones that are heavily uh, immigrant, no difference whether illegal or legal, this isn't about that, it's just about uh, you know, eligible voters, you have to be a citizen to be, to be a voter. Um, there are some disparities. Uh, in Texas, for example, the way that the state senate uh, legislative districts are drawn, um, from the highest uh, percentage of eligible voter district to the lowest one, there's a difference of about 1.75 times. Uh, in other words, there's, let's say, stylizing it, 100 eligible voters in one district, 175 in another one. It seems like the one, the voters in the first district, but the same number of total population in each district. You see what I'm getting at. So the, in the first district, each vote uh, is worth 1.75 times more than it does in the second. Do we have to equalize that in addition to total population, instead of total population? Um, it seems like uh, this is a matter of line drawing ra rather than principle. Uh, it couldn't possibly be the case that Texas could draw, there are 31 Senate districts, right? It couldn't draw 30 districts with one eligible voter in each one and all of the other voters in the rest of the districts, but still have total population. That would seem to violate the principle of one person, one vote. This is just coming up lately because um, the foreign-born population in America has been growing in the last several decades. When the one-person, one-vote cases were first decided uh, in the 60s, that was sort of the nadir of uh, foreign-born um, residents in the United States. The, the lowest percentage 
in the last century was, uh, was hit in 1970, where I think 7% uh, of the country's population was foreign born. Now we're up to about 13 or 14, and of course that's accentuated in certain uh, border areas and states and things like that. Uh, so very, uh, very curious case. There's a battle of the demographers as well about how can you measure these things because total population is, is measured by the, by the decennial census here, how, what kind of measurements will states have. Uh, curiously, when the Justice Department or the ACLU or the NAACP are bringing Voting Rights Act claims, they typically use citizens of voting age population. So perhaps it is possible to accurately measure uh, populations other than uh, uh, total pop. You have strange bedfellows here. So the, the traditional civil rights organizations are supporting Texas and Mississippi. Um, you have, uh, you know, the, the Republicans and Democrats are sort of aligned because they kind of have a, a cynical pact uh, whereby you have, you, you bleach out uh, certain districts that are more white, more Republican, and then you guarantee majority minority districts. So the ones that are politically speaking, partisanship speaking, uh, it's white Democrats that are, that are really being hurt by this sort of thing. But we'll see, there's a lot of cross-cutting dynamics here uh, as, as you see. Sticking with Texas, uh, and moving to an equally, if not more, controversial issue, uh, racial preferences in higher education. Fisher versus UT Austin is back at the court. Two years ago, the, the court issued kind of a, kind of punted, issued this very narrow opinion just saying, all right, lower courts, you shouldn't defer so much to educational administrators. They don't know what they're doing. They don't have the expertise. You really need to scrutinize if they really need to use race uh, in admissions. Uh, and the Fifth Circuit basically rubber stamp, reissued their same previous opinion. Uh, and the court didn't have to take this case. There was no split, uh, but took it again. Presumably this time uh, we'll have a much uh, sterner opinion, probably throwing out uh, Texas's policy, although not necessarily reversing uh, Grutter, uh, which is the, the, the diversity can be a, a compelling interest uh, in using, uh, uh, for the gov allowing the government to use race in certain contexts. Notably, Justice Kennedy has never approved an affirmative action program, but has also never slammed the door on using race. And I predict, however the final opinion comes out, that will continue. Um, and finally, Friedrichs versus California Teachers Association, which could end up to be the most significant case uh, of the term. Um, the issue here is uh, certain public sector workers who are not members of the union, of the public sector union, uh, don't want to have to pay what are called agency fees that some states nevertheless allow the unions to compel them to pay. Agency fees go towards collective bargaining. Uh, and the unions are, are saying, and the, the states uh, that, that have these laws are saying that uh, the workers get the benefit of the collective bargaining even if they're not a member of the union, so to prevent free riding uh, and preserve labor peace, we should allow the compulsion of these uh, agency fees. Well, the workers, in this case teachers, are saying we don't even agree with what the results of this collective bargaining are. They, they might be going for more tenure-based protection, seniority, we, want, we might want merit-based. They might want uh, more budgets for certain things, we might want uh, that allocated different ways. And moreover, whenever a public sector union in, engages in collective bargaining, that's no different than lobbying, than lobbying because remember this affects uh, education policy, budget policy uh, in the state. To rule for the teachers here, the court would have to overturn Abood versus Detroit Board of Education, a case from the late 70s uh, that allowed the, these agency shop uh, arrangements. Uh, and they're likely to do that, frankly, if, if you wanted to uh, uh, bet on this case. In two previous labor cases in the last several years, the court has intimated that, that Abood uh, is, a, is a doubtful doctrine, and I think they're, they're hungry to rebalance worker rights versus union rights. Um, well, look, I'll, I'll conclude on this. Um, when the dust cleared this term, uh, there was one aspect uh, that was particularly gratifying to me, and that's that uh, Cato continued its uh, winning streak in cases in which we filed amicus briefs. So we weren't as dominating as we were in more recent terms, uh, 15 to 3, 10 to 1. This term we were 8 to 7. Um, uh, and uh, we continued to be kind of this quixotic organization, the only one in the country that was on the challenger side in both King v. Burwell and Obergefell, for example. We kind of had that uh, sort of issue uh, in the previous terms uh, as well. So it was a pretty good year for liberty, though obviously not without its disappointments. And more importantly, we fared way better than the U.S. government, which went 8 and 13. 
Um, although for the first time ever, as I said, we and the U.S. government were on the same side for that one case, the North Carolina dental case. Um, many of the, uh, the government losses, including two unanimous ones, were in criminal cases. So we do have a lot of overzealous prosecutors and, and police abuse and things like that. Um, uh, but regardless, the government has continued to be, this administration has continued to be the worst performer before the Supreme Court uh, in modern history. I don't have statistics going back to William Henry Harrison or anything like that, but certainly in the, say, post-World War II or the last hundred years, um, this administration generally goes about 40 percent on the win side against a historical norm of uh, 70 percent or so. And if you just look at the unanimous cases, setting aside the ones, oh, well, you know, if you're talking about, well, the five fours can be Republicans versus Democrats or what have you, on the unanimous cases, uh, they're setting records uh, in terms of losses, uh, uh, double uh, the unanimous loss rate of Bush, uh, of Clinton, and triple that of uh, Bush. Uh, as Miguel Estrada commented when summarizing the uh, Solicitor General's abysmal performance a few years ago, when you have a crazy client who insists you make crazy arguments, you're going to lose some cases. And indeed, if you're defending uh, outlandish executive actions uh, or taking real envelope-breaking uh, positions, um, uh, then that is going to uh, result in uh, sort of uh, libertarian or anti-government, but I repeat myself, uh, sorts of positions. And so, if the administration, if the government wants to improve its standing before the court, I humbly suggest that it follow Cato's lead in uh, advocating positions that are grounded in the law and reinforce the Constitution's role in securing and protecting liberty. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm going to try to be quick. First, I want to thank the Federalist Society for putting this on, and I especially want to thank Ilya for coming down. He's extremely generous with his time and his insight. Um, he, Ilya started with Walker, the, the license plate case, and I, I just want to say that I think the reason that Texas won so surprisingly in that case was because my boy Scott Keller argued it, um, which just goes to show you take my federal courts class, good things can happen. Um, <laughs> so all three cases I want to talk about are cases that did little things but may portend much bigger things down the line. The first one is Zivotofsky versus Kerry, which is the Jerusalem passport case. Bouncing baby Zivotofsky is born in Jerusalem in 2002. His parents are both U.S. citizens and they want to have recorded on his passport that he was born in Jerusalem, Israel, because they feel strongly that, that Israel owns Jerusalem. The State Department has historically tried to avoid taking a position on that question as a matter of foreign relations, um, trying to keep everybody happy, and so they refused. But the parents were able to invoke a congressional statute that said um, specifically that if you are born in Jerusalem, Israel, then you have a statutory right to have, if you so choose, your place of birth recorded as Jerusalem. Israel. So why is this important? Because it's important because it sets up a conflict between the president and Congress on a question of foreign policy. And the Supreme Court holds 6-3, Kennedy for the liberals plus Thomas, that the statute is unconstitutional um, because it infringes on an exclusive presidential power of recognizing foreign states. And recognizing foreign states is thought to include the power to recognize what the territorial holdings of those states are. Now, the reasons this is, this is really important is because it's the first time, to my knowledge, and I think to everyone's knowledge, that the Supreme Court had ever sided with the president in a question of presidential powers where Congress had expressly forbidden the president to do something. So you remember the classic formulation from the steel seizure case where Justice Jackson says, look, there, there's three boxes, right? There's situations in which the president acts with Congress's authorization when he can basically do anything that the federal government as a whole could do. He, al he always has power in those cases. There's box two, which is the twilight zone where Congress hasn't said anything about whether the president um, can do something and, and all bets are off in those cases. And then there's box three where the president is trying to do something that Congress has explicitly or implicitly forbidden him to do. And in those cases, the president's power is at its lowest ebb, Jack Jackson says. The president had never won one of those cases until Zivotofsky. So it's quite remarkable that the court was willing to say that even a congressional statute can't keep the president from doing what he wants to do in certain areas. It is the same argument, for instance, that um, John Yoo infamously adopted in the torture memos during the Bush administration, in which he said, you know, the president, Congress can't tell you not to torture people because you have the commander-in-chief power, and that commander-in-chief power is exclusive, and even if Congress acts in pursuant to one of its powers, 
um, like regulating the armed forces, it can't tell you not to do things that are within the commander-in-chief power. And everybody thought that John Yoo was crazy, that he ought to be disbarred, and yet the Supreme Court adopts basically the same argument in Zivotofsky. I think the dissents here are really interesting because they're by the people I would have told you before this case are the biggest executive power hawks on the court, John Roberts, Antonin Scalia, and, and Justice Alito. Right? And so they take a very, very strong position that um, the president doesn't have, it can never go against an act of Congress. And so looking forward, um, it's hard to say. You know, on, on, the, on the one hand, it looks like you know, the president now has this precedent where he can say, I can, I can defy an act of Congress if I want to, as long as it's within an area that I can say is an exclusive power. On the other hand, I think the president's coalition in Zivotofsky is a lot weaker um, than the dissent going forward. It's a, it's a lot more dubious that people like Justice Sotomayor and Justice Ginsburg are going to continue to side with the president in these kinds of cases than it is, given the strong language in the dissents, that the, uh, that the dissenters are going to continue to be hostile. So, you know, we'll see. It's because we didn't file, so they didn't yeah. know how to vote. That may, that may be your problem. Um, second case is Reed versus Town of Gilbert, and, and this case may be a sign of apocalypse because um, at lunch yesterday, Professor Benjamin and I just absolutely agreed down the line about this case. So um, Reed is a funny little free speech case about signs. The Town of Gilbert, Arizona regulates outdoor signs, and it has different requirements for ideological signs, political signs, and temporary directional signs. So Reed is the pastor of a small church that meets in various temporary locations, and so they need to use directional signs to tell the parishioners where to go on, on each Sunday morning. And so the town decides to crack down on Reed's signs, but he has the last laugh in the Supreme Court, which holds the ordinance unconstitutional by a vote of 9 to 0. Now, what's interesting about the case is that the opinions sweep unusually broadly. It's, it's like they were bored with the issue in the case and so decided they wanted to say something striking, which they did. So these opinions are a sign, as it were, pointing in the direction of much bigger conflicts over free speech ahead. Sorry. Um, Justice Thomas writes for the majority, which is Roberts, Scalia, Kennedy, Alito, and Sotomayor. Um, he says the town's law is content-based and therefore it triggers strict scrutiny. He defines content-based pretty broadly um, and he rejects the notion that a content-neutral justification for the law would take it out of the bad land of being content-based. And once you get to strict scrutiny, then this law is never going to pass. Um, Justices Breyer and Kagan both concur in the judgment, and they would have preferred not to decide the level of scrutiny because, as Kagan says, the law does not pass strict scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny or even the laugh test. And they're worried that applying strict scrutiny to all content-based laws is going to aim a wrecking ball at much of the regulatory state. So consider, securities regulation requires certain content to be included in disclosures to the stockholders. It prohibits certain speakers from talking at certain times surrounding the IPO. It forbids false or misleading statements. All of these things are blatantly content-based regulation of speech. Uh, medical drug and device regulation and tort law strictly regulates the content of warnings to consumers. Right? Informed consent laws require wh you know, what the doctor has to say to the patient before they operate. All these things are content-based restrictions on speech. Maybe some of them can pass strict scrutiny, but I bet a whole bunch of them can't because particularly in the speech area, strict scrutiny is, generally speaking, fatal in fact. So are these kinds of regulations subject to strict scrutiny? You know, the pro-regulatory people in the court are really worried that, the, that we're going to have you know, a, a lot of speech cases challenging much of what government does, because much of what government regulates involves speech of some kind. Think about what the largest industries in the country are, telecommunications or you know, information technology. All of these industries, everything they do is speech. There's extensive regulation of them. Um, if it's all subject to strict scrutiny, then you're going to have massive judicial intervention in the regulatory yeah. state. Um, and that's, I think, the possibility that a case like Town of Reed, even though, or Town of Gilbert, even though it doesn't seem like a big case, is presenting. Um, the last one is the Arizona State Legislature's case. Um, this case about who has the authority to control redistricting. Does the Elections Clause of the Constitution require that legislatures do redistricting, or is it permissible to do what Arizona did, which is have a referendum that shifts that power to an independent redistricting commission? That's the merits. I don't care about the merits. I just want to talk about standing. Um, <laughs> and 
this case is an important standing case because it presents more starkly than any case I've ever seen um, whether an institution has standing to litigate encroachments on its own power. You know, so think, so think about Congress, for instance, wanting to litigate the line, the, the line item veto as an encroachment on its, on its own power, which they weren't allowed to do. Here, the Arizona legislature is itself the party, and they want to say, this has limited our right under the Constitution to control redistricting, and we want to assert that as an institution. Um, this court says that's fine. You have been injured directly in your capacity as legislators. And it's the whole institution. It's not just a couple of legislators that are suing. It's the entire legislature as a body that is suing. Much like the House intervened in United States versus Windsor, for instance, much like the House is suing in the, in the new Appropriations Clause lawsuit about Obamacare, much like the state of Texas in its sovereign capacity is suing to challenge the immigration policies of the, of the Obama administration. So this is a pretty important issue. Uh, five votes say that this is fine, that, the, that they can do this. And, and it's going to be hard to distinguish, I think, this case when we move to federal institutions trying to Seven bring, votes. Was there outstanding? Well, so we get three votes in the joining the dissent, I think. Um, and then Roberts doesn't weigh in. On, and, and his separate dissent is on the merits. And so I think implicitly he is Was saying. Was it two others that joined Scalia? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Scalia goes apoplectic and says, you know, it's, it's simply not a case or controversy when you have an institutional body that is trying to protect its own power. And the reason I think this is interesting is because the alternative for institutional bodies to protect their power is to rely on what we usually call political remedies. So what are political remedies? There are things besides lawsuits. They tend to be things like, I don't know, shutting down the government, or not confirming any executive appointees, or not raising the, death, the, the debt ceiling because you're mad about some other policy that the administration has, has gone through. Right? And the, the conventional wisdom, although that we've never had a square holding on this, um, is that wherever those political remedies are available, then institutions should rely on those rather than going to court to resolve their legal differences with other institutions. And I guess I just want to ask you know, whether we should stick with that conventional wisdom. How are those political remedies working out? You know, how, how do we like you know, these government shutdowns and debt ceilings, you know, you know, games of chicken? Um, is that the best way to resolve differences among the government? And, and hopefully, you know, I think the court ought to probably try to experiment a little bit with litigation of these matters and maybe the Arizona case suggests that they will. Um, I just want to say a couple things about the Obamacare case and Obergefell. All I want to say about Obamacare is the Chevron holding is really important right? because the court says even though this is ambiguous we're not going to defer because this is too big a question for it to be plausible that Congress would have delegated the power to decide it conclusively to the agency. If we're, about, if we're going to continue to be in a situation where Congress is largely deadlocked with the president and the president tries to do everything through executive action, then Chevron is going to be probably the most important battleground in terms of the division of power between Congress and the president. And so this is a pretty big chunk out of Chevron, I think. Um, in Obergefell, I just want to say um, my view on this, is, uh, on the politics of this, I think, is directly contrary to, to Ilya's, and that is I'm a social conservative, so I think the government ought to articulate a vision of the good life and ought to intervene on questions like marriage. I think marriage is one of the most so important social policies that we have. Um, now, social conservatives have seen Obergefell as a massive defeat in the culture wars, and I think that's just a huge mistake because it seems to me, you know, the, the, war, the culture war used to be you know, should we have marriage or not? Should we have government regulation or, or not? Should we have, you know, the gay rights movement often took the position that marriage was, you know, an inherently hetero thing. It, it was, we should, get away, we should get away from that and just have new and unconventional lifestyles. What Obergefell marks, I think, is just the, the conclusive victory of marriage as a paradigm for social organization um, and of the government's responsibility to regulate that in an even-handed way. I think that's a massive victory in the culture wars for social conservatives. And you know, those of us who are social conservatives ought to have the, social, the good grace to acknowledge it um, and quit complaining. All right, so um, the only thing I'll say about the coming term is that the, you know, if Virginia is, is for lovers, this term is for federal courts nerds. 
right? So we have a case about the 11th Amendment, whether a state can be sued in, in another state's courts. We have a case under United States versus Klein, which is the screwiest single case in the federal court's casebook um, about whether Congress can essentially dictate the result in a pending case. We have standing cases where people have no injuries at all and still think they ought to have standing. It's awesome, right? So you know, I have no idea how any of these are going to come out. So we'll, I think we have a few minutes for, for questions. I don't know if there's a class here afterwards, but I'm happy to stick around either here or outside if you want to talk as well. If anyone has questions at this point, um, we'll be brief. No questions at all? We were either completely clear or completely obscure. <laughs> um, yeah, I had, I had a question on, on Obergefell, because I think I'm just as confused as, as uh, was mentioned earlier. Um, if you could shed any additional light on exactly how Kennedy's reasoning seems to be working, because there seems to be at least some of the language points to, you know, ideas of unenumerated rights that seems to go along with the Ninth Amendment, but there's no mention of the Ninth Amendment as any sort of, you know, legal mechanism. Um, do you think he's trying to find some sort of like unenumerated right, uh, you know, vested there? Or I, I'm, I'm very confused as to just how he gets to the Well, team. you'll have to uh, listen to another talk I give called The Sweet Mystery of Anthony Kennedy. Um, <laughs> he does have coherent theories of jurisprudence. They just don't match up with anybody else's coherent theories of, of jurisprudence. Uh, you will always, if you're advocating in front of him, you want to make sure that he sees your case as one of federalism or other structural protections for liberty. That's, that's what he likes. But anyway, on this case, um, so he doesn't use the conventional, you know, is this a protected class or semi-protected class, which means heightened scrutiny or rational basis or, you know, is there a compelling... I have less problem with that because kind of the scrutiny land, that rubric is, uh, is a legal artifice invented by lawyers. That's not in the, in the Constitution. Um, where he's going, it's, it's, it's kind of a, 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 a redux of his Windsor opinion uh, in that you could see that he kind of wrestles with marriage is so important and in fact marriage is so important that it seems like you don't fully self-actualize as a human being unless you're married. Those of you who are single, I don't think Justice Kennedy feels that you have full dignity yet, so <laughs> go ahead and get married. Um, and he runs very briefly, like a sentence, two sentences each on perhaps on, on claims that states might have, why they, uh, what their arguments are, but not really. He sort of gets these out of the way perfunctorily uh, about tradition and about children and, and things like this. Um, and he doesn't say whether, he's, whether this is a fundamental right or kind of a, a hybrid of due process and equal protection. There's a lot about dignity and uh, things like this uh, to which Chief Justice Roberts replies in dissent, there is no nobility and dignity clause uh, in the Constitution. It wouldn't be the Ninth Amendment because that's for federal um, uh, government action. It would be the Fourteenth Amendment. So uh, as I said, to me it's a simple equal protection claim to him, it's kind of generic stuff that the 14th Amendment protects that states can't treat people in ways that hurt them and for no good reason or, or, or something like that. I mean, in a certain sense, uh, Justice Thomas does well to call him out for completely confusing what positive and negative rights are. If you take Kennedy's so-called logic to its uh, uh, conclusion, that would mean that if a state got out of the license, marriage licensing business altogether, someone could sue them to force them to get back into it because then they'd be denying you that fundamental right of the piece of paper. It can't be the case that in our natural state of nature we're all born with certain inalienable rights, including the right to get a piece of paper from the government. Um, so I, I don't think that Kennedy would ultimately rule that way in such a case. I'm, in fact, personally, I'm, I'm disappointed that no state got out of the marriage business or p didn't pass some sort of contingent legislation saying that if a court strikes down our marriage law, we're going to get out of it altogether. But um, so uh, again, uh, effectively what you have is a ticket good for that train only. Uh, and who knows, for any of those issues that I listed or other sorts of whether it's gay rights or other types of uh, issues. I don't think, uh, you know, a, a judge who's predisposed to rule in a certain way 
will cite Kennedy's opinion regardless of what side they're on, I suppose. Uh, but it, it, it just doesn't read like a legal opinion. Um, and he probably wasn't trying to make it sound like a legal opinion. He was trying to write for the ages. Yeah, I think John Marshall wrote like that sometimes. He, he didn't use a lot, cite a lot of precedents, did a lot of make a lot of technical arguments because he knew his audience was broader. And I think Kennedy is, is trying to write it that way. I don't think it's quite as bad as, as Ilya does. Um, I think the, I do think the best framing of the issue in Obergefell is actually <laughs> in Justice Alito's dissent in Windsor. And he didn't get in Windsor that the issue in Windsor was kind of different. But if you want you know, to put, pose the equal protection question most precisely, I think Alito does it I, I, you know, better than anybody else. I think you know, he gets the ultimate question, you know, answer to the question wrong. But basically the question is, what does equality require right, it, with respect to marriage? And that depends on whether same-sex couples and different sex couples are similarly situated, whether marriage is an institution that is broad enough to cover them both, in which case it would violate the Equal Protection Clause to um, exclude one of them. And that depends on whether you think marriage basically is a you know, procreative model of marriage, which it probably was in the beginning, or whether it's a romantic model of marriage where two people commit to each other, in which case it's hard to come up with any even rational basis for excluding same-sex couples. And I think you know, it, you know, at that point, the Equal Protection Clause functions in much the same way that the, due pro the Procedural Due Process Clause does or the Takings Clause does, and that is that it, it's cannibalistic it, it, or it's parasitic on other questions of ordinary law. So the Takings Clause depends on property rights defended, defined by law out there, you know, state law, common law, statutory law, and it, it incorporates those. And I think the Equal Protection Clause does much the same thing, right? It in incorporates a notion of marriage, and so you have to look outside the Constitution to see what is our notion of marriage you know, at, at, at the present time, I think. And, and I think at that point, it's, it's a pretty easy case, right? I mean, the law has moved away from a procreated model a long time ago, right? And, and I think there's, there's plenty of hints of all that in Justice Kennedy's opinion. He, he doesn't say it as, as precisely as you might like. I mean, obviously, if they let me write the opinions, the world would be a better place, but um, <laughs> they don't. So. I'm just glad Roberts didn't call it a marriage attacks and therefore universally applicable. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Appreciate it.